All right, so looks like we are on. So image evaluation and production. So bear with me if my voice cracks a little bit, I'm a little, little under the weather, but I think I'll be okay. Uh, so the plan I think is to take a 15, 20 minute break, like sort of in the middle. Um, yeah, we don't wanna go three hours straight. Uh, so nine, 1030 ish or so we'll we'll see what slide we are and where a good segue might be yes bathroom breaks, I just said. bathroom breaks you just go yeah and yeah so don't worry about that yes actually i sent the slides out already um so you should have a link to the slides already, but um, you'll get another link with the audio attached to it. And then you could look at both of them simultaneously. If you really want to. What's that? Uh, yeah, this is going to be synced. We're recording right now. So uh, the only thing you won't see is my picture, which I used to do because I'm kind of vain. But I realized that uh, it, it shows up like on top of text and doesn't work out so well. So I got rid of that. Uh, all right, and I think I can hide this. So this was my uh, most difficult lecture to really ever put together, because what I tried to do was actually take the content specs and create slides uh, for each one. Um, but I also numbered the slides, most of them. I kind of gave up at some point. Um, that correspond. So you should be able to search through this to find the topics that you want at, at any given time. Because it is, I think, 176 slides. So, um, and there's gonna be a lot of questions uh, on image, right? Like 64, but there's more than that because it kind of includes some of the stuff that's in safety and protection. Uh, and equipment has been kind of lumped into there. So I took all of these and they're all in there. Every one of them. Smoothing, equalization, you name it, it's in there. Um, and they kind of look like this. So I'm going to talk quickly especially on some of the beginning slides that I hope you kind of know. Uh, and then we'll slow down where appropriate. And I'm thinking of skipping uh, some of the patient care kind of stuff like technique charts and some of the stuff they could just really read that I can't really add too much information to verbally that's really going to benefit you much. And we'll try to you know, spend more time on some of the digital stuff. Uh, that's more complex. So, any questions? Mass, MA times time? We should know that in order to produce radiation, we need to create electrons. That's done with our MA. We apply a little milliamperage. It's kind of like a little electrical signal. Thermionically heats up that filament and then boils off a bunch of electrons. The more MA that we apply, the larger the quantity or the larger the intensity. And then when you add in time, it's like creating yet another group. So I've often described it as kind of like you have an army of 300, but then you add another second, you have another army of 300. Of course, it's milliseconds, right? Another army, another army. So the combination of how big your army is, is your MA. And then for time is how many armies do you keep creating? And all that adds to the intensity of your radiation. And together, when you multiply them together, you have your, your MAS, right? And it's all proportional. Uh, so if you double your MA or you double your time, essentially you double your mass, you'll get double the intensity, twice as much radiation. Pretty easy to understand. If you want to cut the dose of the patient, cut the MA in half or cut the time in half. Which one would you rather do? Why? Motion, yeah. Cutting MA is, is not going to 
stop motion from happening. Not that time will, but if you reduce the time, uh, you have less chance of motion. So that's the way to go. Okay. I think we already said this. So screen film environment is what SFE stands for. Uh, I still make a few references here and there to what life used to be like uh, in film. Uh, film's been gone for a while now. It's been off the registry for a while. Uh, everything should be digital. I do use the term, since we're on this topic, um, density here and there. Uh, density is the blackening on the film, but since there's no film, we don't really use the term density. But a lot of the theories are the same. You know, instead of increasing density, instead of making something darker, what we really do with the same theories is just increase the intensity. Also, there's a, an attendance sheet uh, moving around, so just make sure you get to that. And as a reminder, um, just for our record keeping, please sign in to Trajexis and sign out later. Try to remember. I don't want to have like 50 like unpaired records. You had a question? Oh, okay. Yes. Is it the same optic density with density? Uh, so no, we don't really use the term density anymore. It's now been called, it's called brightness. Uh, so now things are either brighter or not as bright. Right. So not as bright means dark. There was a lot of questions on optical density. Um, oh yeah, those are, those are old terms, right? I think I mentioned optical density once in this lecture when we talk about screen speeds. Uh, and where they came up with a particular speed was based on creating a certain optical density uh, as measured by a densitometer, but that's really kind of an old term. So the mock registry, by the way, um, yeah, maybe parts of it could be updated, um, but it was designed to be kind of hard um, so that it's kind of like exercising with your weights, you know, and then when you take them off, in other words, hopefully the test is a little easier than the mock registry, you know, you can really fly, All right? So don't feel bad if you didn't do as well as you think you could have, because chances are you will do better on the actual registry. Okay. Um, so reciprocity law just says that any combination of MA or time should give you the same intensity of radiation, right? So if you double the MA and half the time, you're back where you were with the same intensity. So that's why it's also good to, to be able to cut time and increase MA. Of course, you can only increase MA so much. You only have, what, 300, 400? CT, you have about 1,000 MA station, but uh, not so much. Also, you're restricted by your filament, uh, in other words, your focal spot uh, when it comes to MA, right? You may have seen in our lab, I know it's a long time since you've been in the lab, but uh, occasionally it'll switch automatically when you change to a certain technique from a small to a large focal spot. So KV or KVP, of course, we know the peak means that you don't go over the amount that's set, but you certainly have a heterogeneous beam consisting of many different wavelengths, many different strengths of photons. But initially the KV is known as our potential difference that we apply across the two. We started with MA just a second ago and we boiled off some electrons. They sit inside that molybdenum slash nickel focusing cup and the fact that the focusing cup, and you'll see when I get to it, has a little bit of a negative charge to help propel or push the electrons towards the anode, it's really the thousands of volts that we apply to get those electrons to fly across to the anode. And we can say that KV is both a quantity and a quality factor. So we think of it most in terms of quality, 
uh, because it affects the penetrability of the beam, right? If we have a thicker object, we need more KV. But uh, if you look in the book, um, you can also see there's a particular diagram that illustrates it really well, that when you increase KV within the actual anode, within the tungsten atoms, uh, you produce more photons. So your intensity also goes up. And we know this, we've known this for a long time, because if you associate this with the 15% rule, you'll remember that when you increase KV approximately 15%, what happens? Well, you don't double the mass. You, if you left the mass the same and just went up KV, what you meant to say is you double the intensity, right? Um, and here's an example of what I was talking about earlier. We used to say in the screen film environment that if you went up 15%, you would double the density. And that's no longer really true. Now we just double the in, the intensity versus the density. So you're doubling the amount of radiation. Uh, so you get kind of, I don't want to say the best of both worlds necessarily, but compared to milliamp per seconds, uh, KV is not only quality, but also quantity. Uh, and of course, 80 kV is going to give you a more penetrating beam than 70 kV, for example. Questions? No, we're good, right? The thing with kV is if you don't use enough, you get noise and a grainy appearance. You get something known as photon starvation, quantum model, uh, an image that's noisy, no good. So in digital imaging, you can get away with a lot of things. You could use a lot less radiation. You can use a lot more radiation. But if you go down too much, you get noise, and it's no good. Right? Um, I don't think I have to say much more about this. You need at least the minimum amount of KV to penetrate the part, is the general rule. Everyone uses probably a little bit more than that. Everyone adds a little more salt than they probably have to. <clears throat> Is there an effect of KV on scatter? Yes, it's not dramatic. Uh, KV will increase Compton scattering. If you remember, Compton scattering is the occupational dose because Compton scattering, by definition, is a photon that might lose energy, but it changes direction and actually makes it out of the patient. If it interacts with the image receptor, uh, then it can degrade your image. Okay. If it interacts with you, then it can ionize your atom. So this is where you have to be careful about patients uh, being held by someone uh, or your own occupational dose. Uh, photoelectric is great for us as technologists because it gets stuck in the patient. So no occupational dose, but it's the worst kind of dose to the patient, of course. And it's the majority of the dose to the patient, because if you remember a very small percentage, one or two percent of radiation actually makes it into what they call the remnant beam uh, and comes out of the patient. The rest gets stuck. It's pretty amazing how inefficient the whole process is. Because if you go back to the two, the process of just production of radiation is mostly heat, something like 96, what is it? 99.4% heat, 0.6% radiation. And then of that small amount of radiation, Almost 100% of it gets stuck in you photoelectrically. But less so if you increase your KV. You increase it a little bit more. So as mentioned, you know, changing your KV will increase the intensity, right? Increase the quantity. Uh, but it'll also make your photons stronger, uh, 
but we can't say words like stronger. We have to say there'll be more shorter wavelengths, right? which means stronger beam. OID. So you also might notice that this jumps around a little bit, but I'm just going by the specs. It's the way the specs are. So kind of tried to go with it. Uh, so OID is the distance between the image receptor and um, the bottom or the posterior aspect of the part. Uh, we'll go over it in not too much detail, but we should know that OID has an effect on magnification. So we should always reduce the OID as much as possible. Uh, there's also an effect on the quantitative radiation. Sometimes they use OID in terms of an air gap technique. I might mention that again uh, when we go over grids briefly. Um, but mostly it's about magnification and distortion. My rule is a little bit of OID is better than tilting and objecting and creating either elongation or foreshortening. I'd rather have something a little bit magnified, which is one form of distortion, than uh, the other, in my mind, worse types of distortion like elongation and foreshortening, which really change the shape versus the size of the object. I should probably turn myself on vibrate too. Um, anyone ever use an air gap technique? It works surprisingly well. What was nice about it at the time is when grids weren't as robust as they are now. When the grid frequencies were lower, you had more chances of what was known as grid lines actually appearing on your image. And they could be a little bit distracting. Uh, we may have done a lab way back where I tried to illustrate some grid lines to you. Um, of course, an air gap is nice because there are no grid lines because there is no grid. Right. SID, not nearly as impactful on the image as OID. So if you have to pick which one is worse for magnification, it's OID, right? Few inches of OID recognizable. Right, go from 72 inches SID to, I don't know, 76 inches SID. Can you see it? No. Even hard to measure with all the cool, expensive test tools that, that we have. Um, but SID is the distance measured from the image receptor, not the part. Okay, so be careful with that. It's from the image receptor to the two. And, you know, technically, when they say the two, it's not the collimator, right? It's to the actual x-ray tube, which is like 12 inches away from the bottom of the collimator. When you think about it, it's really where those cylinders are, you know, the metal encasing. Uh, and the effect of SID on intensity is probably well known to you. You know, at a macro level, we know that if you increase the SID Radiation goes down because more photons die in the air. And it's governed by the inverse square law. Yay, you will have an inverse square law question on the registry. Like I'll bet my 15 year old Hyundai. You can take it. I'm like waiting for something to happen. Generally about it or actual actually used formula. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, if, if you, so one of the things that I, I should point out to you, and I did this on some of your quizzes, and some of you realized it, and some, most of you didn't. Um, if you cut the distance in half, radiation quadruples. No need to actually write the formula down. Right? You could save a lot of time. People did anyway, and that was nice, because it means they know the formula, because if I tell you that the SID you know, goes from, I don't know, 40 to 53, then it's not so easy to do in your head, right? So here's the formula. Um, we're not gonna go through a question. Um, there are many questions like this, but it's I1 over I2 
equals d2 over d1. So why it's called the inverse square law, uh, you'll see you have 1, 2, 2, 1. And uh, yes, Jatan. Yeah, um, regarding the formula, um, was on a red review that I found out that they're using another formula, mass 1 over mass 2, but that's not inverse square law. No, that's direct square law. Yeah, and, but the, the thing is, sometimes you get confused when you have to use the inverse square law compared, you know, verse to the math. So let's talk so, about that. So, um, <laughs> yes. Answer to maybe help. When you read the question, you have to make sure that the question's not asking about exposure specifically. When the question asks about the exposure change, then that's when you know to use the inverse square law. But when it's asking about like um, um, intensity change, then you know that it's using this direct square law. Or if mass is mentioned in the question, you know to use the direct square law. Whereas if um, the exposure, um, what is it, rats or renkins, something like that, one of the grays, if, if one of those are used, you know that it's talking about exposure. So you would use the inverse square law. Yeah, I really couldn't have said that any better. Um, you know, if, if you see the word mass in the question, it's likely to be direct square law. If they're asking you for the new amount of radiation, it's inverse square law, right? So, so you, have to, you have to read the question. And then what I was going to say but before you ask that question is just be aware, and you know this from my quizzes, this is like in a sadistic fun way for me, you know, I would always come up with, you know, the wrong answers that make sense if you have the formula backwards or upside down in any which way you come up with an answer, right? Not just random numbers. And I did that, you know, so that our percentage of the registry would be high. So Russell Espinaz is on board with my, my choices, uh, my distractors as they call them in the testing business. So yeah, be careful, right? The other thing about uh, inverse square law and direct square law is in direct square, again, we have mass, but we have one, two, one, two, right? It's not inverse. Right. But like I said, if you mix up any of the formulas, chances are you'll see an answer, but double check your work. And also, don't change your answers unless you really, really, really think it's necessary. Right. And most of the time people change their answers. I know this. I see it all the time from correct to incorrect. Right, you have to, I don't want to say never do it, right? But you have to really feel that it's the appropriate change because chances are you were right. What, what changed? You know, unless you noticed mass versus intensity and then you're like, okay. Uh, okay, in terms of SID's effect on uh, distortion, again, we're talking about magnification. Right. We're talking about changing the size. There is also an effect that is part of that size change, because when we have magnification, we get distortion. Uh, and when you have distortion, your spatial resolution goes down. So higher SID is better. Of course, uh, table work uh, is designed to be done at 40, because all of you vertically challenged people, myself included, if they went up in SID anymore when you were doing table and bucky work, you'd be on tippy toes or, or something. So they're really getting it pretty much as, as high as they can possibly go. And 72 inches is a pretty good number. Um, you know, I suppose they could go further, use 100 maybe. <clears throat> Focal spot size. Focal spot size. First of all, we have what's known as dual focus tubes. If you see the word dual focus, that means two focal spots, one larger than the other, but really 
the size of the focal spot is based on the length of the filament, right? You can't look at an anode and say, oh, this is the part that's large focal spot and this is the part that's small focal spot. It's all about where that stream of electrons comes in and the width of that stream, which by the way is called the cathode ray beam. If you ever hear that term, cathode ray beam, it means the stream of electrons moving from cathode to anode. The anode has a bevel or an angle on it, like this here. And based on that angle, two things occur. Well, a few things really occur. One, the majority of the radiation goes down towards the window in the tube. But two, it will have an effect on what's known as the effective focal spot which is even more imaginary than the actual focal spot, which is the part that gets bombarded by that cathode ray beam. When you have that cathode ray come in and hit that angle, right, it will narrow down, right, making the effective focal spot smaller. So a couple things. Effective focal spot is always, always, always going to be smaller than the actual focal spot. And the law that governs this change in width from thicker to thinner is something that you should have committed to memory. Anyone? Line focus principle. Excellent. You guys are studying. Uh, show of hands, how many people are taking the registry within the next two weeks? No? <laughs> Took it already? <laughs> good, good. You don't want to wait too long, right? You get all this stuff in your head. Okay. So it's a line focus principle that reduces, I just realized it's in the slide. So it wasn't too much of a question for you guys. Uh, but uh, it has an effect. Uh, on what's known as unsharpness, or sometimes it's referred to as sharpness, or sometimes it's referred to as a number, and sometimes it's referred to as kind of overall affecting spatial resolution. You see how many different ways you can talk about these things. So uh, when you have a tighter beam, which is what line focus principle does, uh, you end up with less penumbra. I believe it's a smaller angle that gives you, am I right? Let me know. A smaller angle that gives you a smaller effective focal spot. Uh, and by this diagram here, right, you can see that your penumbra is reduced, which means your sharpness goes up, right? Technical term for sharpness, and we'll talk about this later, is spatial resolution. Used to be called detail. Mm -hmm. Does the filament, the size of filament, affect the, uh, the, the focal spot? I mean, the because we have two actual focal spot and the effect is focal it, spot. Does it affect the effect of focal spot as well? It does. Yeah. So, so the the way you have to kind of look at this is, you have two things going on. You have size of filaments, and then you have angle on the anode. If you just look at the size of the filament and basically forget everything else, you could say a smaller or less lengthy filament is going to give you a smaller actual focal spot, which then gets even smaller based on line focus principle to give you a smaller effective focal spot. And that's not even mentioning what the angle of the anode is. So when you're just comparing filaments, smaller one gives you better spatial resolution, uh, no matter what. Um, the, and then you have the angle, of course, of, of the anode. So why do we use a smaller focal spot? For that reason, 
even if there was no angle, right? If you were just hitting a you know, perpendicular flat anode, you would still have better spatial resolution with a smaller, I mean, in theory, right? It would be a tighter cathode ray beam before it ever gets to the end. Nick, you had a... What's the term of the angle of the anode? Does it change like how it changes from the filament size? That you could have a smaller wash? How do you manipulate So that? the angle does not change. It's constant. It's whatever you purchased and whatever they built. Right? So it varies from machine to machine. What is it usually? 7 to 15? Something, something around there. Seven to seventeen. All, all yeah. The questions that we have are like, is that like change the anode angle to this. Like so, this so the book. Question. Yeah, you might have. Yeah, those are theoretical questions, right? You, there's no, there's no. It would be nice, uh, but there's, there's no cool button that angles anything for you. You know the way a gantry in a CT, you know, world would work. <clears throat> yeah. So, as you guys have already realized. You know, things that normally wouldn't happen, happen when they're asking a question on the registry. You know, the registry will be like, you have 15 inches of OID. Really? When would I ever really have 15, you know? So you kind of just have to take the questions, you know, with a grain of salt almost, right? Um, I mean, don't willy nilly pick an answer. I don't mean that, but the, the stuff that they ask doesn't happen in reality in many cases. Some things are very, very relevant. But. So those shoulder, those shoulder x-rays at 100 SID are totally fake? I've never done one. What is absorption penumbra? This is discussing basically, aside from the size of your filament, the angle of your anode, your OID or your SID, the object itself will create its own inherent distortion based on how much radiation it absorbs and different shapes of objects will absorb more radiation than others. The least amount of radiation that is absorbed will lead to the least amount of distortion. So LL, least with least. So the trapezoid on the left indicated by A. And again, you know, the book uses these extreme examples. I mean, when does an object fit perfectly so it's so symmetrical and, and such? But again, you kind of have to go with it because you can make generalizations afterwards. But in this case, the divergence of the beam is looking like it's matching up so perfectly that the beam itself becomes one side of this trapezoid, leading to the least amount of penumbra and a very vertical looking uh, line here on uh, what they call this absorption penumbra trace diagram. I don't know if you'll see that term on the registry. Right. Some of the things that are in your textbook uh, are not necessarily, you know, words that you would see. But the concept, though, is correct. If you move over here, you're getting more absorption with a sort of square object uh, where the slope has been reduced. Right. So now we're at an angle. So we have a hill versus just a vertical uh, climb. A spherical object, right, uh, doesn't match up at all, right? This kind of beam skims with it. So we have a very low slope, which go, is going to lead to uh, the most distortion, the most penumbra, right? So spherical objects are the hardest to image. Uh, and we kind of did this in the lab uh, when we took the head of the femur and we did some things with it. <clears throat> so take home is more distortion with spherical objects than objects that are 
kind of more proportional in that they have strict lines or boundaries. Question? I mean, that might be one question on the registry out of how many you have. And speaking of how many registry questions there are, I'll realize that I believe 20 or so are pilot questions, meaning it doesn't matter whether you get them right or wrong. It doesn't affect your score, except you don't know which ones they are, right? They don't say, this is a pilot question. Let's just test it out on you, uh, which is what they're doing. So if you feel horrendous about a particular question, well, maybe it's one of those pilot questions. I mean, you'll never know. Don't feel overly bad and storm out for one question or two. And I can't remember, does the test end now as soon as you pass? Or you have to sit for all of them? Oh, the nurses are lucky. I think their test, as soon as they pass, it stops. Does it, does it do that? For nurses? Yeah, but not for us. Okay. But in a way, that's it's kind of detrimental if you think about it because you might be like oh my god I, i'm continuing to take questions i must not be doing well so i i don't know maybe it's better to just, just do the test right versus when i time this at home after an hour and a half i, I should have passed and now it's two hours and you're like oh my goodness okay uh i'm not going to do much math these are the kind of things you have to you know practice at home uh, use your textbooks. Hopefully you haven't sold them yet. By the way, you know, try to sell them. We have a new group of students that can barely spell x-ray uh, coming uh, in, in just a matter of weeks. So I'm, I'm sure they'd, they'd love those expensive books. How can we reach out to them? Is there like a board for the books um, You can maybe give us like a piece of paper with some contact information and we can get it out to them. My book's still the same. So yeah, if the version changes, that's a different story. But um, my particular book hasn't changed. I can't talk for all of them. So uh, there is a formula. There are potentially lots of formulas. Um, I try to go over the ones that I think are, are important. So you might have this unsharpness slash penumbra, which is why unsharpness equals penumbra here. And it's the focal spot multiplied by the OID. The example here is you were given a 1.5 millimeter focal spot times a 30 uh, centimeter OID. Again, who ever has a 30 centimeter OID? All right, that's like, what is that in inches? Um, 13, 10, at least 10 inches or so? I mean, 12, even worse. Uh, divided by your SOD. Uh, and when you get this, you have penumbra spreads across an area of 0.75 millimeters. So your unsharpness is a little bit less than a millimeter, but that's a, basically saying there should be a little fuzz that's about a millimeter around the object, right? The penumbra versus the middle of the object, which we call the umbra, umbra and penumbra. So before we get to this, uh, test questions, important to do lots of questions. Keep using um, the, the yellow book uh, and the, the rad easy, is it? The more questions that you take, I think the better. And, and here are some suggestions. Take the content specs, right? After you do a series of questions, like a mock registry, and by the way, you should do a couple more of them where you actually sit down for that long period of time because it's kind of like a marathon, right? You have to train. You can't take the registry. I'm sure everyone would increase their percentage of answers correct if you were able to do like 20 questions, you know, a day for like a few weeks. But that's not the case. You have to do them all within that allotted time. So you have to practice just sitting down and taking that long of a test because it's worse than a, it's worse than a final exam right 
The other thing is you take those content specs and after you've done like a mock registry, you should review each question that you get wrong. But not just review it, you have to see how many of those questions are, are asked about on the content spec. In other words, is that particular subject matter heavily questioned? Because the content specs, while not perfect, gives you this number of questions based on this topic. And you have to make a choice on if they ask a lot of those kinds of questions, then you have to put in some more sweat and study. But if it's something that they hardly ask about, I'm not saying you shouldn't look it over or review, but maybe you don't put as much time into it as the other questions where they ask more. In other words, don't study page by page. Study where they ask the most questions and then study a little bit less where they ask the least amount of questions and do that analysis a few times. It'll help target your study a little bit. I know it's natural, for me it's natural to take the textbook and say, okay, I've gone over these eight chapters once upon a time, now I'm gonna start at the beginning. Read this one and read the next one and read the next one and highlight and, and do all those things. But I think if you kind of come across uh, quantitatively, uh, it might be helpful. Okay. Grids. By the way, I just attended a online seminar. Grids are going to go away, probably. Some of that grid software is really good. Um, grid algorithms software. I know they're starting to use them on some portables, um, especially if the, if the patient is not too big. But for now, it's still on, on the spec. So grids are designed to do one thing, which is what? Absorb scarring radiation. Well, yeah, they do that, but what's the, what, what do they really do? What? Increase contrast. That's what they do. How do they do it? By absorbing scatter, right? Which is the number one. All right, maybe I shouldn't say number one, but it's up there in the contributing factor of, of scatter. Uh, and scatter and, and noise start to get a little bit weird in terms of which is more and which is less. To me, scatter is a form of noise, right? Scatter shows up the same way other types of noise show up. Grainy, not so good. <clears throat> so another way we could say is uh, grids are designed to reduce noise and thus increase contrast. Because whenever noise goes down, contrast goes up what kind of questions might you have on the registry? Well, what can they really ask? They can ask for the grid ratio, right? So they can give you a couple numbers and then you need to know that grid ratio is the height of the lead strip divided by the distance between the strips. So grid ratios, high definition, HD. That helps. In terms of theory, we can say that a higher grid ratio will lead to better scatter cleanup and thus less noise and thus higher contrast. We can say, however, that when the grid ratio goes up, it means that the lines are getting closer together. And because of that, it makes positioning and alignment more difficult. Which is why when you go on a portable, you should probably not use the highest grid ratio because you have less latitude, and we'll see that word again, for alignment and positioning, where on a portable exam, that's what's lacking. You don't have your tube detonting and, and making your life easier and getting right to the center of things. Right. Um, you all have found portables more challenging, I hope. I mean, I, I don't think they're easier than a regular chest x-ray. And that's not mentioning 
all the patient considerations about why you're doing a portable to begin with. Okay, now this is different because I went with your textbook. And your textbook was kind of like, whatever your grid ratio is, just multiply it by four, right? To, to adjust your technique, because that's the other thing, right? We know that if it's absorbing more scatter, it's also absorbing more of the uh, parallel remnant beam. In other words, it's absorbing some of the good stuff, right? It's almost doing too good of a job. So what we have to do with grids is we have to kind of overshoot our technique. So not only are we creating kind of more scatter, but we're also making sure that we have enough uh, good intensity beams to get the job done, right? Which is the big downside of grids, right? Because they add to the exposure. So technically, if you look at Bouchon, you guys have Bouchon somewhere for something, right? I used to use Bouchon and uh, we had this forum. Now, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know if you have to memorize this or not. For RAD review, For RAD review you do? Yeah. Okay, so it might not be a bad idea because the specs don't really tell you that you have to memorize it. But that also means that you don't necessarily not have to, it means maybe you should, because don't go with just because it's not there, I don't need to know it. Um, so the question might be, when you're going from one grid to another, like going from an eight to one to a 12, what do you do? This is the formula. In other words, how do you change your mass? First of all, you should obviously know the concept and be able to eliminate one or two questions. Right? I mean, if you know the mass is supposed to go up, any question that doesn't go down, you cross that one out. Right? That goes for any question, by the way. Always eliminate things first that you know are obviously wrong. Uh, so this is just a, a simple equation where you know your first mass. Your second mass is usually x because it's based on you know changing your grid factor. And you're going from, the, the question will say, you're going from one grid or no grid at all, uh, in which case the number would be one on top. Uh, and your grid conversion factor two, which is all of these numbers here. And they're also based on different KVs, right? So if the, if the question says, you know, 70 KV versus 120, it can be the difference between a three and a four, right? So it's kind of a lot to memorize. So 16 things. It just says, so the, so that's kind of a compromise. I would go with just the average thing because it's less to memorize. And then hopefully the question is not so specific like the mass that they list in the question. Hopefully one number is not 25 and the next, and A is 25, B is 26. And, and C is 27, you know, that would be tough, right? Hopefully, if you know the average that's ballpark, then you get the answer correct. So I would go with the average. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's the thing. So the registry is a link to any particular textbook and this chart changes from place to place. So my guess is by going with average, will get you the right answer. You guys on the same page with me? But this is the formula though. Right. Filtration. Filtration is designed in a way opposite of grids for patient exposure. It's all about saving radiation to the patient. So simply said, filtration will eliminate some of the longer wavelength beams, the ones that are weaker, uh, that would not really change the subject contrast or affect negatively the image in any way. 
That's all I have to say about filtration. It's a good thing. What's the magic number on filtration? 2.5. Some of the filtration is already in the tube. That's known as what kind of filtration? Filtration material? Aluminum. Sometimes copper. Yeah. That's true. So the, the minimum filtration is 2.5 for uh, a machine that's operating at about 70 kV. Uh, I can tell you that uh, CT that is running typically at 100 or more kV has about five or six millimeters of filtration. I don't want to confuse you with numbers, but your theory is right. Right. If, if you're operating at higher KV levels, then filtration is increased. So if they have a question like that, the filtration is based on the KVP. Questions? Yeah. Does the collimation part of the X-ray tube, you know, consider as part of filtration as well? Or is it just yes. Uh, you might read different books, say different things, but... Some of the things off the top of my head that include inherent filtration are the mirror in the collimator, uh, the oil, and what other, other stuff that's in there. So parts of the collimator are definitely part, as a matter of fact, inherent filtration, I think is two millimeters out of the 2.5. Am I correct on that? One and a half. Is it one and a half? One and a half. And then the other one millimeter is added. So you actually have more inherent filtration that makes up that 2.5 uh, than you have added filtration. <laughs> it's hard to remember all the numbers, right? Even when you talk about this stuff all the time. Uh, so good segue uh, to collimators here. Um, not much to say here. Right, collimators help, in a way, do a very similar function as what the angle of the anode does. It kind of helps to streamline that beam, right, uh, and make it more laser-like than fan-like, reducing uh, penumbra, right? So scatter goes down when you collimate. In addition to that, of course, you collimate areas that are not needed diagnostically, so you lower the dose to those areas. So no reason not to collimate. Um, there's good uh, dialogue about collimation recently on the ASRT communities group. Seems like more and more techs are not collimating. It's unfortunate. Some places are very strict, some places not so much. That's all I'll say on that. For the registry, collimation strictly uh, will increase contrast, so no reason not to collimate. Motion, we already talked about motion. Uh, motion will add to the distortion in the image. It's a little bit weird. Sometimes it's, it's known as false images. It comes in two varieties. It's either voluntary or involuntary. Voluntary, you know, if you can communicate with your patient, uh, is something that may be able to be controlled through communication. Uh, if it's an involuntary, then obviously uh, there's not much you can do except reduce your time. <clears throat> Motion shows up kind of like a blur. Right. Anode heel effect. Simply said, but people often forget. But the first part is that the radiation is more intense, there's more of it, on the cathode side of the tube. And people always talk about that because it leads to positioning thicker parts towards the cathode side. 
what I want to bring out is that it goes down about 25% on the anode side. So don't forget the other part of the two, right? See, it goes 75% lower on one side. Well, 25 really. You only have 75% of what you started with is what this is saying uh, versus there's more radiation here. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, I think it was the same question. I was trying to remember certain rooms that have been in the hospitals and not every hospital is just like Okay, so that's a good question. So, when your tube is facing the table, you have a, you know, a, a, a a negative side here and a positive side to your left usually because the patient's head is, if I got this right? The cathode side of the tube is where we have more intensity. So cathode side should be on the, on the right. Towards the feet. Because that's how you put the pillow most of the time. Now, when you turn the, the tube, it's still going to be the same effect that you'll have more towards the cathode and more towards the anode, uh, less towards the anode, excuse me. Uh, I guess you would just have to read the question. I'd have to take a look at it. It was, it was like, do you put the, the bookie at the head of the table or at the foot of the table? In certain hospitals, they have the bookie by the head, and certain hospitals have the bookie by the foot. So I was like, I don't even know. <clears throat> I didn't even look at Well, there's, there's no real way to know where the cathode and the anode are, except for the little stickers that they sometimes put on the tube itself. They put plus and minus on those. Mm -hmm. Those are already manufactured, already printed. So in our lab once, I, I proved that they had put the stickers wrong. Yeah, I don't know if the room is still like that in our lab, <clears throat> but um, it's pretty easy because the engineering people, they probably don't care. Oh, here's the little stickers. <laughs> Um, but you can tell with a, with a dosimeter, right? We did that. We did that lab. But let's let's bring it back uh, to this here. So I'm not sure about that question. I'd have to take a look at it and 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 see what the choices are exactly. But um, we just want to remember that based on this, and the reason why it happens, I should mention, is let's say the radiation starts here. Um, as it's coming down, it has more and more chances of getting absorbed by more of the anode. Thus, less gets out over here than up here. So you get more radiation in this area than over here. It actually hits what they call the heel of the anode. <clears throat> so that's where it gets its name. Uh, of course, you see this evidenced more the longer the length of collimation that you have, right? So you don't have to think about the anode heel effect if you're doing the finger, right? Where it comes into play more likely is something like tip, fib, or fib. Right. Um, yes. Under the uh, angle of the flow, would you see the would you see this more on a smaller anode or on a, uh, a smaller focal spot or a larger tube? Okay, good question. There is an effect of the angle of the anode on whether you have more or less anode heel effect. I can't remember if it's smaller or larger at this point. So that is something to look up. Does anyone know off the top of their head? <clears throat> I, I mean, I know I have it in a slide somewhere. The angle is deeper. If the angle is deeper, so less angulation, more perpendicular. If it's more right, if it's more perpendicular, then you have more anode heel effect. Right, right, right. Because you get more absorption. Okay, that that makes sense. By the way, speaking of all of my lectures, I never touch them. 
they're probably still there. So if you have access to your previous classes through Blackboard, all my stuff should be there. I never take them down. There was a question regarding red review. They were mentioned like uh, a specific SID when you see the more uh, emphasize the analog human effect on, on the matter. Like uh, if they are much closer, uh, let's say like 30, 35 SID, you might see more of that effect on analog angle. So, so there are a couple questions I heard related to this. <clears throat> it sounds like one we, we pretty much have, which is what is the effect of the angle of the anode on anode heel effect? Then uh, there's a question on does the focal spot size itself have an effect? I'm not sure. Uh, I think the percentages might stay the same. Maybe the quantities of radiation might change a little bit. But <clears throat> The other question that, that you just brought up is, does SID have an effect? Maybe, right? I mean, SID changes the divergence of the beam. So in effect, it's the same question because it would change the size of the actual focal spot based on SID. It's only so much we can talk about. <laughs> uh, OK, good questions, good questions. In two weeks, I won't be taking the registry. Okay, um, patient factors, not much you can do here. Um, I think this was some of the stuff that I was gonna try to skip a little bit. <clears throat> My goodness, an hour has gone by. So uh, I'm going to skip some of this, right? Because this I think you could just read about uh, most pathologic conditions require an increase, but things like osteoporosis, for example, wouldn't. Um, placing an angle on the two-part or image uh, will affect spatial resolution. Well, only in that it will change distortion. So anything that increases more distortion uh, will affect your spatial resolution negatively. So we all know that an angle gives you elongation. So when you angle the two, in any direction. Uh, and sometimes we use this to our benefit. To, it also pushes anatomy kind of out of the way. Uh, so it helps remove superimposition sometimes. Uh, angling can also sometimes line things up, like on the a lateral knee condyles, for example. When the part is angled, it will usually result in foreshortening, right? Things kind of get squeezed together. And then when structures overlap, it makes it more difficult to see what you're attempting to see. Image receptor could be a little bit of both, uh, depending on what part of the part you're looking at, right? Usually uh, image receptor angling, in my mind, if I have to pick elongation or foreshortening, I usually go with foreshortening. If you have a choice on a question. Yeah, so if you read this, right, image receptors angled, uh, the result can be foreshortening or elongation, depending on which end of the part is nearest the two, right? Um, but if you have questions that you have choices, and choices are foreshortening, and another choice is elongation, I would go with foreshortening as an answer when it comes to the effect of angling the image receptor. Uh, another formula that I will not go over too much, right? Uh, this is for relative sharpness. It doesn't talk about the focal spot. Right? It's just based on the ratio between SOD and OID. Yes? What do you get for when you angle the part, not the image receptor? Yes, you do. So foreshortening can happen in one of two ways. If you angle the part, like if the if you angle the, the elbow, it's going to become foreshortened. Uh, if you angle 
if you kept the elbow AP, but you angled the two, you also get foreshortened. The image receptor, did I say the, sorry, not the two. Shouldn't you get the longitude? Uh, most of the time it's foreshortening. We've, we've done this in the lab. Right? Um, <clears throat> where where you, you, you can take you can take a pencil or, or or I've done this with a ruler, and then you put the cassette on on an angle sponge and it gets short. Yeah. So relative sharpness, okay, without focal spot is just the ratio of SOD over OID, right? These are questions that you just kind of have to uh, practice a little bit. This is kind of like a two-part, though, because it's the relative sharpness between one exposure versus another exposure. And then you have to divide in order to figure out which one is sharper than the other. And then when you're done, you won't ever have to do this calculation. <clears throat> oh yeah, right. Everyone pulls out their their calculators. Yay! Second part of registry specs. Uh, so I think a lot of this we're going to skip because I think you can read up on that. Uh, APRs. Those are. Uh, programmed calipers. No one's using them anymore, of course. Um, once upon a time, they, they were used to kind of figure out our KV. Uh, one of the reasons why they're not being used so much is because it doesn't account for pathology. I mean, it's just measuring the, the one side of an object to the other. A uh, fixed versus variable uh, are two different types of KV charts. Uh, again, we're not going to talk too much about it because this is the part I wanted to skip. It's hard for me to skip. Right. I want to talk about stuff. But, okay. Uh, this is a good rule to remember, 2 kV per centimeter, approximately, um, when you're increasing kV on a variable kV chart. This, your book has. So I wouldn't expect this to be on the registry. Um, this is more like a rule of thumb that could be helpful after you pass the registry and are working with, with techniques. Um, okay. So we can get past this. Uh, of course, we increase KV for cast unless it's plastic or fiber. But if it's plaster and, and there's less and less of those around, um, you would have to increase and double usually. It's double the mass and add either no up to 10 kV. Uh, these are things you have to memorize essentially. I would kind of know maybe what's on this box. I mean, obviously there are hundreds of pathologic conditions. You can't memorize them all. And it's not high stakes. It may be one general question that falls into common, like you know, pneumothorax or osteoporosis or something, right? Um, hopefully, the registry uh, is not like a quiz just on this stuff, like I may have had in class, where it forced you to kind of really keep keep it narrow. But I, I have the feeling the registry is a little bit more broad than that. Uh, special considerations for pediatric patients. Uh, what to do with our KV when we use barium, usually high KV. If we're using uh, injected contrast, uh, usually lower KV so it doesn't burn out. Uh, AEC, gotta love AEC. <clears throat> right. uh, based on detectors, determines when radiation has completely gone through. So they don't work if you don't have enough KV, if you don't have enough intensity. If they never feel anything, that's bad, because that means what happens? They don't turn off. They keep waiting 
and then you keep exposing the patient and their belly fills up with radiation. No good, right? So there are some rules about AEC, positioning and alignment, really important, choosing the correct cell. Uh, so you need to know the consequences because you'll have questions like this on the registry of what happens to the intensity of the radiation if you choose the wrong cell. There's only three ways you can ask those questions, pretty much. In terms of AEC, what do you set? Well, you still have choice over focal spot, right? Uh, unless you're using so much radiation that you have to use the large, but it is something that's somewhat controllable. You still have control over your KD. And you probably have control over your MA. But uh, it's time. It's the exposure time that you don't have to worry about. And that's huge. Right? Uh, most of these systems are three detectors that combine information to actually make a determination of when to cut off the exposure. So they talk to each other, especially if they're all on, right? If only the center cell is on. Uh, what would happen, by the way, if only the center cell was on and you did a PHS? Other way around. It's an overexposure. Why? It picks up on the T-spine, nice and thick, and goes, I'm going to penetrate a little bit longer. You might have a great T-spine, but then your lungs look flat. So just collimate and keep it in the back. So when they do order the T-spine, pull that one out. <laughs> yes. But if you activate just the center one for the cell, and then you let those two uh, like for uh, like accidentally because you do a PA, but instead of uh, setting up for the PA, you do it for the bladder. And then that way, the exposure is going to go, I mean, the radiation is going to uh, go to those two other cells as well. Yeah, but they're turned off in the example that I gave, so it doesn't matter. So I use that example because that's really common. So you have these chest rooms and, you, and you're constantly going back and forth between two, one, two, one. Someone does a lateral because they did that after the PA, you walk in to do the next PA lateral, and then you don't change it, and then you're left with the central one on for the inject. That happens, unfortunately, more often uh, than not. So that's why I use that as an example, because that's something that actually happens. Yeah, if these are not turned on, um, they're off, right? They're, they're just not going to measure anything. Uh, so again, uh, really important uh, to make sure that you have the correct cells uh, and that you're aligned. Because if, look, let's say that T-spine again, this time you're doing everything correct. You have the central cell on for the T-spine, but only half of it is on the cell. Then you might have an underexposure, right? Because parts of the cell are going to pick up on raw radiation, not to mention that'll mess up your system. Talk about <clears throat> uh, some legacy terms. There's still a density control system, but what it really is is intensity. This is kind of what I was talking about earlier, right? Um, usually range from negative two to plus two, but what it really does is it changes the the finish line essentially. It determines how much the capacitor is allowed to fill up with charge before an actual signal is given to the electromagnet to pull off the exposure switch. So uh, typically, most of the books talk about uh, an approximate 25% change in the length of the exposure, either 25% less or 25% more, um, each step that you increase. Uh, it's useful. It's not the same as backup. 
right? Backup time and minimum response time are two other things, right? Um, and what's weird is, I don't know, we, we get back to AEC, but later on. Maybe I should mix these up next time and just try to stay on the same topic. But for some reason, it goes from 1C4 to 1D1, and, and we get into some imaging stuff. All right, so let's go there. Uh, so spatial resolution uh, is based on a lot of different things. Right? Some of them are the physical characteristics of the system you're using. So for instance, in CR, indirect versus direct uh, means a big difference, right? In indirect, you have X-ray turning to light and then light turning to an electrical signal. That's two conversions, whereas direct is just X-ray to electrical signal. Of course, when you have less switches or conversions, your spatial resolution goes up. So whenever you have less conversions, spatial resolution increases, unless you diminish it somehow with other characteristics. But I mean, a lot of these questions just ask you one thing at a time. So don't bring too many thoughts into the question. Don't read into things too much. Also, I, I saw this on many of my quizzes over the years in terms of reading into questions. Don't answer the question as if you're trying to figure out what you would do to make it work. Like for instance, the answer might be uh, the intensity goes down, but the student will write on the test, increase mass. And their thought process was, well, I increased the mass so that the intensity wouldn't go down so that I would get a good radiograph because that's what you think most of the time in clinic, and that's the way you should think. But my questions, and which are based on registry questions most of the time, uh, are designed, you know, if this happens, what do you do? It's kind of like if you increase the SID, the intensity of the radiation goes down, but students will say, somehow, their thought will be increase the intensity because that's what you should do if the distance is getting longer. See what I mean? Don't do that stuff. Don't read into the questions too much. That's how you get them wrong, even when they're easy. So what else affects spatial resolution detector size? Smaller is usually better, right? Uh, and pixel. Well, detector, el yeah, detector element size, um, not thickness. When thickness increases, things get better. Uh, phosphor thickness. So the, these are very general terms that you can kind of go all over the place with. It, it narrows down a little bit more uh, in the subsequent slides. Uh, and pixel and matrix size have a big factor. So pixels are square. Um, they could be rectangular in other modalities, but I think in CR and DR, they're square. They are set up in rows and columns on what we call the matrix. You multiply the rows by the columns to figure out how many pixels you have. To figure out how many gray scales or potential grays that any one pixel can demonstrate, that's the bit depth. Uh, it's always uh, base two to the bit depth as, as the power, right? So if the bit depth is eight, I always use that one by the way, on every test I give. If you want to tell the new people coming in that the answer is always 256. Because you, know? <laughs> you notice our calculators at school suck, right? They don't have the little things. That... Um, <clears throat> so the, the point though is if they tell you that it's a, a bit depth of 12, right? It's two to the 12th power. Uh, spatial resolution, sometimes referred to as the sharpness of the image. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the ability to, to distinguish objects that are in close proximity to each other or adjacent to each other. I've always used, you know, the sand on the beach sort of analogy that you can pick up some sand and if you can see the borders between them, that's good spatial resolution. If it clumps together, that's not. 
that's different from contrast. It's not being able to see the different grayscale shades between the grains of sand. It's just countability, if that's a word. Uh, sometimes spatial resolution is also thought of as how small of an object that can be resolved by the system. And you'll see in one of the slides coming up, we have a question on what is the maximum spatial resolution in line pairs per millimeter, which is basically how small of an object can be resolved, visualized. Obviously, where things start to blur, you're losing your spatial resolution. Right? You can have a whole lot of objects in here and, and not be able to count them. So the maximum spatial resolution is inversely proportional to a doubling of the del pitch. So you have to start there. What is the del pitch? The del pitch has two definitions, but it's the same thing, really. It's the distance between one side of the pixel and the other side, which is actually B, or the difference between the center of one pixel and the center of the other. The only real difference that we discount and don't even think about it is technically there must be some uh, dimension to this interspace material. Right? There, there has to be something there, but we don't really think about it. Uh, so our dot pitch stands for P. All right. uh, to make something inversely proportional, we have to flip it. So instead of having 2P over 1, it's 1 over 2P. So in this particular example, you're given a del or dot pitch so that either one will work, or pixel pitch. Any of those words that have pitch in it uh, are, are essentially the same. So we have 0.1 times 2, so 0.2, when, uh, so 1 divided by 0.2 is 5 line pairs uh, per millimeter. And just to make sure I broke out my calculator earlier and checked. It is. Uh, you'll be given a calculator. By the test, right? And a whiteboard. So that you can you know, write stuff down. They don't give you scrap paper, I don't believe. Right? You get like a dry erase thing, I think, maybe? No, you can't. You practically have to go naked. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they don't allow any, any outside stuff. Yeah, so if you're really good at, at, at knowing your calculator, that may not help you. Uh, detector element size. So most detectors are pretty big. Right, because there's a cost factor. If you have too many small detectors, then they won't work on good objects, on bigger objects. So most of the time you have 17 by 17s, which pretty much fit just about everything. And if objects are bigger, then um, some of you are probably already familiar with this, that they stitch things together nowadays, digitally. Uh, and they come out pretty good. Um, one thing, and I know I've said this to you many times, I don't know if you remember, there is a magnification variable when it comes to the size of a CR cassette or the size of the collimation on a flat panel detector. So when a smaller size cassette is being utilized compared to a larger one, the object will be magnified. Right? Smaller cassette, magnified image. The opposite of that is larger cassette minified, which is why we don't use a 1417 and do a wrist x-ray on it, right? Because it'll look tiny, tiny, right? But same thing goes for, for DR, right? The more you collimate smaller field size, the bigger the object will appear on the screen. I don't know what percentage, I don't know the difference between a 10 by 12 and an 11 by 13, what that does to magnification. I hope you don't get a question like that. I've never seen one. By the way, don't flood me, but if you have some really good questions that seem to make no sense, 
uh, email them to me and I'll try to answer uh, to everyone, uh, especially if it's something that I think everyone will benefit from. Uh, okay. So magnification uh, has an effect based on cassette size. That's one thing you never had to worry about in screen film. You know, it was what it was. Uh, okay, so typical matrix, 512 by 512. Again, multiplying them will give you the individual pixels. Pixel size itself, like one individual pixel, uh, you might have this, is the field of view divided by the matrix. Right? If the, so here's an important note. If the field of view is given in centimeters, you must convert that to millimeters. Generally, you just add a zero. Right, so 25 becomes 250. The matrix, if it is given to you as 512 by 512, you do not multiply them and then divide. Just take 512 and divide it into the field of view. So 250 divided by 512, in the example we were just maybe talking about, is the answer in millimeters. Yes? So if they have diff uh, different matrix with different dimensions, right? Um, then you would multiply them and then divide? Okay, that's a good question that I hate answering. There are certain questions that people always ask and I never have a good answer. His question was, so if you have an uneven matrix, in other words, a rectangle, right? So so it's not 512 by 512, it's, it's 256 by 512. Then what? Then do you multiply them to get? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I never seem to know. I, I, that never happens, though. In MRI, that happens, but you always divide by um, the, the first number is always phase and the second number is always frequency. And one is the horizontal and one is the diagonal, and you always divide by the phase. I don't know if that's the same in CRV. So I kind of have an MRI answer, but not a, a, a CT. I'm sorry. I, I, radiography answer. My guess is that won't happen. They will give you 256 by 256, 1024 by 1024. The numbers will be the same, indicating that length and width are the same. Um, smaller they get, better spatial resolution. Okay, um, I say we keep going a little bit. What do you think? And then we'll take a 15 minute break. <laughs> you guys are funny. Um, all right, let's just do this one slide because I practiced this one. I did because there's a lot going on here. All right, there are a few slides in here that I was like, I gotta get this one right. Okay, so we're talking about a few things here. We're talking about wavelengths and amplitudes. They both have different effects on spatial resolution and on contrast resolution. So you gotta know which one is which. So first of all, both A and B have the same wavelength. So the distance between apex of each wavelength here and here and here and here are supposed to be the same in this example. Indicating that they both have the same spatial resolution. They both have the same ability to resolve an object, right, that is the same size, right? Let's say a small object. When the wavelength is shorter, so when these distances come together closer, and you'll see this in some of the other slides after this, we can say that the frequency is increasing. And that makes sense too, because if you're you know, books use this term like the observer, you know, the metaphorical observer. And you're looking at waves coming by. 
and you're counting them. If the wavelength is shorter for that same amount of time, you will have more waves go by. So shorter wavelength, wavelength down automatically means frequency up. You with me? Frequency up means you can see smaller and smaller objects. So when frequency is increased and when wavelength is decreased, spatial resolution is increased. Now, the other part is what's known as the amplitude. The amplitude is the height. Now, those are different, right? A is much higher than B. The amplitude does not affect the spatial resolution. The amplitude affects the contrast resolution. So amplitude is the reason why the boxes themselves are dark black on A and gray on the bottom. So we can say that higher amplitude gives you higher contrast, more black white. A lower amplitude gives you a lower contrast more gray, more scales of gray. Yeah, I think I got it right. I think I got it all right. I told you, this is a lot to unpackage in this one, right? You guys good with that? All right, we're going to revisit this again in some other slides, but I'll, I'll mostly be repeating myself, right? A couple little tweaks here and there. All right, let's take a little break. Or break, as you say. Uh, uh, it's like, let's say 1040, uh, 1055, like five minutes to. Five minutes to 11. Okay. Is this, this where the amplitude, you know, is referring? Okay, so we are up to Dells and detectors. So here is a typical detector. Of course, these things are, are really, really tiny, um, but even so, they are still broken up into different parts. And one of the major parts where the phosphor is, uh, is your, known as your Dell surface area. Um, but how big it actually is, is your fill factor. So the larger the fill factor, the bigger this Dell surface area is, and the more photons it can quantify and use as part of its data for your ultimate reconstruction. So in other words, for this fill factor to get bigger, the two other aspects of this, the thin film transistor and the capacitor, would have to get smaller, right? What it means is photons hitting the storage capacitor in the TFT are useless, right? Uh, all of this plays an effect on what we call later on detector quantum efficiency, or DQE. So DQE can be affected by several things, but one is the fill factor. If the fill factor goes up, the DQE goes up, right? And typically, if the fill factor would increase, then you would be able to use less radiation, right? Um, because right now you're using an amount of radiation where you know some of it is going to be lost by hitting areas outside of this fill factor, outside of the actual Dell surface area, right? Uh, to compensate for the fact that you're losing some, you always increase your technique. Like we said, that's the kind of thing you do with grids. Um, you're always increasing your technique to account for all these different things. Um, so there's room to, to reduce our exposure, especially if our fill factor 
uh, is reduced. And in terms of signal to noise, <clears throat> signal is, is sometimes hard to describe. I think of signal most of the time as the creation of more data and good data because noise is the opposite of signal. Right? Um, so when I think of signal, I think of giving the computer more data to work with. Uh, so not much to say on here back to our matrix this is just typically what it would look like just remember smaller pixels uh, yield higher spatial resolution and the only other thing i would mention here is the big if that's if the field of view doesn't change i don't think they'll trick you but if i were to put extra lines in here and crisscross, then our matrix certainly goes up and the pixels get smaller. That's the scenario I hope your question is based on. However, if the field of view increases, so the borders extend, then you can look at it. It doesn't actually happen this way. And I spent some time over the last few years trying to explain this in more detail. And I think it's just easier to think of the pixels as kind of stretching out and getting bigger. They don't really change dimensions. What changes is how the computer analyzes them. So the computer can analyze the pixels in large groups or smaller groups. When you analyze smaller groups, your spatial resolution will go up, but your computer time will also go up and the extensiveness of the reconstruction the reconstruction is increased. Uh, when you look at pixels as a larger group, right, meaning that they've gotten bigger in the case of if the field of view was increased, then you're analyzing, analyzing it and kind of looking at it as if the frequency went down kind of like what we were talking about before. Uh, and that would lead to a decrease in spatial resolution. I hope the question, or better yet, I hope the answer to this is twice per cycle. Uh, Nyquist is a theorem, so it's kind of like a theory or a way of doing things that says when sampling the signal, which is the stream of data coming in, right, uh, especially when making a conversion from analog to digital information, is that you look at that data, what's known as twice per cycle. Um, I don't know if I want to draw on the board right now or if I even have anything to do so. Um, but it would be, let's see if I can draw this out a little bit. If you were to look at each of these data points, so basically what I drew is like three waves and there's a dot on each one and a dot on the bottom troughs. If I were to draw a line here and just kind of go across horizontally on the top, that's not a good sample. That's not twice per cycle. If I were to draw, ooh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did bring two. Anybody have better luck? Yes. Hey, it's permanent oh, please don't let it be permanent luck. No. <laughs> I think they yell at me. So, if you were to just sample this here, right, that's not twice per cycle. Um, this would give you better data. 
right? And allow you to make those conversions there. That's essentially what Nyquist uh, is saying, right? And the more you sample, the more computer power you're using and the longer your reconstruction process would be and the more memory that you might create. So those are all kind of negatives. So you don't want to over sample, yet under sampling can lead to reductions in spatial resolution and possibly artifacts. Now the term that not just radiography uses, but things like MR, CT, they use the MTF or the modulation transfer function which, as we've described as a scale, used to measure how much object information about the actual object is transferred to the image. And it works on a scale from zero to one, which doesn't sound like a big scale, but it goes by tenths of a point. So it goes 0 0.1, 0.2, 0.5, up to one with the higher number being better resolution, lower number, not so much. A zero, which is certainly possible, is basically zero information about the object is transferred to the image. That would be a black image or maybe a white image, based essentially no image. Now that can happen if there's some kind of malfunction. But uh, what will certainly also happen is that you will not reach one because one would represent the opposite, 100% of the object information transferred to the image. We're getting better and better at imaging things, but it's not perfect, right? Uh, a one would be kind of like exploratory surgery. We take out the thing and look at it visually, right? That would be perfect. So we strive to get as, as high as, as we can. Uh, the, the MTF is actually <coughs> complicated and based on other tests that are combined, not necessarily added and averaged exactly, but things like point spread function, line spread function, edge response is another one. Um, they're all kind of compiled into this one number that uh, you can use to shop around with if you're in the market for a machine, essentially, instead of asking you know, the, the smaller or other types of tests that are utilized. So here we have this uh, similar uh, diagram that we had before. Uh, so maximum spatial resolution is equal to the Nyquist frequency, which is the sampling frequency expressed in line pairs per millimeter. Uh, and it's really the same thing as what we talked about before. It's based on the Dell pitch or pixel pitch. Um, that we had back up here, where was it, right? Uh, and then divided uh, into the number one, right? To give us our maximum spatial uh, resolution. So not much difference here. Contrast resolution, we mentioned a little earlier, uh, it's different from spatial resolution. It's probably more important in a lot of cases than spatial resolution, right? Counting objects is nice, but knowing that one object is different fundamentally from another uh, may be more important to us when we're trying to identify pathology. It's represented as different shades of gray Right? If the shade of gray in any two adjacent pixels are the same, then you would assume that the part or the tissue substance is the same, same differential absorption, etc. The only way to see one thing from another or identify different types of tissues is by attributing contrast to them. That's why CT and MRI are all about contrast. Uh, contrast resolution in radiography uh, is affected by what we call the sensitivity of the system. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some of that has to do with speed 
and uh, we'll talk about speed in a second. So speed, <coughs> excuse me. Speed is a topic that's been around since film. And they still use these arbitrary numbers uh, to designate the speed. And it, has, it used to have to do with the emulsion and how thick it was and what it was made of and different factors to that effect. <clears throat> And it was based on a, a standard speed of 100. They just kind of came up with that number. And they said that a speed that was designated as 100 would produce a density on the film of 2.5, which was an optical density measured with a densitometer, which we don't really use anymore, provided that you used 2 MR. And it works in such a way that when the speed is increased, it is proportionately more sensitive to radiation. So for example, if the speed goes from 100 to 200, then you will get an optical density of 2.5, but only need one MR to get there. This is good for patients. Why not use the fastest speed possible? And in the digital world, <clears throat> the speed, in many cases, at least in CR, uh, can be controlled in terms of how fast the laser is moving across the phosphor as it's going through the system. Uh, in addition to that, it can be based on whether the phosphor is dual-sided Right, sometimes some of the CR systems scan both sides. The downside of an increased speed, right, the upside is less radiation. The downside is spatial resolution is reduced. So here are your numbers. <clears throat> Uh, I've tried some of this in the lab, and I couldn't visually see much of a difference, honestly. <clears throat> and they're still using, <clears throat> excuse me, these terms. So people go out and buy a CR system that's quantified as a 200 speed system. versus they get a system uh, that's 400. But again, some of these systems can be adjusted. So you don't have to buy a new system, you just change it. You've probably seen this. Uh, we have this in the lab, right? You can change, uh, you can go what's known as high resolution, which means it'll be slower and require more radiation. Yes? Yeah, as a the speeds on the CR, I mean, uh, does it affect the contrast resolution as well, besides the spatial, <clears throat> spatial resolution? So good question. Question uh, was, is there an effect on contrast in addition to spatial resolution? Well, it says that here. Um, Right, contrast resolution is affected by the sensitivity of the image receptor. So I would have to say yes, but I, it's hard to quantify. Right. Um, so I, I tricked you guys in a way, because <clears throat> whenever I'm not quite sure, I'll, I'll say something like overall resolution. So uh, the reason why I'm explaining this is it's, it's tricky because when someone says overall resolution, what, what do they mean by that? Because we've always kind of tried to break it up uh, between spatial resolution uh, versus contrast resolution. So according to the text, I would assume both, right? Because one thing I can say is everything is improved with more data. So when you go slower and you're increasing your signal to noise, then you're going to get more signal 
less noise, automatically more contrast. So the question is almost like, does it affect spatial resolution? Because it definitely affects contrast when said that way. I'm so good at bullshitting, am I? <laughs> but but no, I think I think I think it affects both. Uh, yes. Is there a quantitative relationship between how much uh, spatial resolution is lost because of the speed increase? So is is there a quantitative relationship? Do you mean is it is it proportional? So we put a numerical value on it. I'm sure you can. Uh, so. So again, I'm assuming, I know you're not supposed to assume, but I'm assuming if you change the speed of the system, the MTF would change, right? I, I, well, it's proportionate in terms of the amount of intensity needed to create a certain density in the screen film world. I don't know if it's exactly proportional to the amount of signal data that you need to create an image digitally. I would say it's not exactly the same depending on the vendor. <clears throat> film, one of the nice things about film is yes, there were different film companies, right? Fuji, Kodak, Agfa, but um, they, we, I always learned and we always treated them pretty much as if they were the same, but now, uh, the CRDR manufacturers are, are all very proprietary and all have very different algorithms running in the background. So it's, it's hard to compare, you know, I would even go out on a limb and say that a 200 speed Fuji digital system is probably different from a 200 speed, you know, uh, Kodak system or, you know, GE or something. Uh, okay, so we were here, we were here. A bit depth we already talked about, so I won't go on here, right? Again, it's two to the actual bit depth, which will give us our number of grays. <clears throat> and here's MTF again. So you're gonna notice a lot of these graphs are, are similar. Um, so we can say that as the line pairs become smaller, closer together, so that's changing the wavelength. So wavelength here is much longer than it is uh, A compared to B, right? As they start to overlap, right, their edges begin to overlap which is what you're seeing in, in C. When that happens, when they get close enough, and we're all at this sort of microscopic scale, so remember, all these pictures that we see and all the things that we try to describe are actually tough when you're talking about things that are happening really, you know, at a very small, tiny level. We start to see that contrast begins to be reduced. So I've always learned that in many cases when spatial resolution increases, contrast resolution goes down. And this points, and I've said that way before ever looking at this thing. So that kind of goes with that same theory, right? So in this case, the amplitude is not changing, but as the frequency increases, meaning the wavelengths get smaller, contrast will go down. Question. Yes. Uh, the size of the depth. The size of the, the depth. Size of the depth. Well, if you look, if you're, if you're saying the same thing as fill factor, yes. Um, if you're including like the TFT and the capacitor, I mean, if you're looking at this whole thing getting bigger, I think it depends mostly on the fill factor. 
mostly on the part that contains the phosphor, right? Because uh, other, uh, again, different manufacturers might just have more padding, so to speak, right? I think it comes down to fill factor being the most important part of the Dell. So does that mean more fill factor better? Because that would lead to less radiation potentially, but also more signal. Again, if you think of signal as a stream of data, you're going to be able to quantify, collect more data if you're counting more photons. And you can count more photons with a larger fill factor. Oh, that's kind of what we're talking about anyway. <clears throat> So the surface area, this Dell surface area, is going to, like we just said, is going to determine overall efficiency of the system. That's kind of a larger you know, subject to what does that mean. Um, in my mind, efficiency is always doing it's kind of the opposite. I was going to say always doing more with less. But it, what it really means is if the Dell remains the same size, but the fill factor in it is increased, that's more efficiency, right? Because that means you're not adding DELs, right? You're making the fill factor bigger. That means everything else gets smaller. That, in my mind, having this larger, another way to think about it is capture air area, because that's what it's doing. Uh, it will lead to increased DQE. <clears throat> Another thing that will change is what this is made out of. Right? Um, so a lot of my PowerPoints go into more detail on these things. I tried to, you know, take out things that I thought were important and put it in. But for more information, besides the book, go to the other PowerPoints, right? Because they specifically talk about the different efficiencies, capture efficiency, absorption efficiency, um, what makes one phosphor better than another besides just thickness. Uh, <clears throat> dynamic range, you've seen this term. It has several definitions, part of it is based on the, the pixel um, bit depth. Um, other definitions are related to the entire system as a whole. That includes both your imaging system, like the tube, uh, versus just your processing system. Uh, so if we look at dynamic range just based on a bit depth, or what's also sometimes referred as bit capacity. It's a lot of synonyms that make things difficult sometimes. Here, a bit depth of 12 gives us over 4,000 different shades of gray, uh, which is the power in digital imaging compared to film screen. So Digital imaging is by far at a higher contrast level than film. But one of the labs I always like doing uh, is where film still beats out CR, at least, in spatial resolution, in line pairs per millimeter, just slightly, but so little that you have to use a test tool to really notice it. So, <clears throat> is a radiologist really going to see that? So like I was saying, dynamic range can also be thought of as based on the entire computer system, software, hardware, imaging system, etc. Whereas bit depth <clears throat> is lower on the totem pole or not at the apex of the pyramid and more related to the actual pixels. So there's this thing that's very helpful that most digital systems incorporate 
that's the basis of the slide known as dynamic range compression or, or equalization, yet another synonym. And what this does <clears throat> is it actually takes the highest densities and the lowest densities, in other words, the blackest grayscales and the brightest or whitest grayscales, and chops them off. So this is good for a couple of things. One, it's less data, less to store. But two, we can say that dynamic range compression, and what's really weird, not weird, but, uh, and you see this in MRI a lot, is you'll have a generic term for a process that other companies call by a different name. So for example, <clears throat> dynamic range compression slash equalization is called dynamic range control by Fuji. So what I tell my MR students, and which I believe to be correct, is that the registry should not be overall specific to manufacturers. They should be using the generic term, right? They should be using ibuprofen and not saying Advil. So what happens here, this process is the same, just different manufacturers called by different names, is that we are chopping off the brightest areas that really don't have as much information. And the darkest ones. And overall, we can say that this equalization process will improve our image contrast. So this is all about contrast, right? Uh, and I don't know how well it, it looks here on, on the screen, but I could see on the right, there's more lung markings, right? You can uh, possibly see a little bit of the T-spine uh, behind the shadow of the heart on the, on the right side, which is, when I was in school, the proper technique for chest x-ray was supposed to show the shadow of the T-spine behind the heart. I don't know if uh, Professor Grassi still teaches it that way, but that was supposedly the adequate penetration, right? Not a T-spine, but the shadow of the T-spine. Uh, so equalization at the end of the day improves contrast, saves data, making it easier to process. Um, again, we jump around a little bit based on the content specs, quantum model simply not having enough quanta, right? A bunch of photons put together is known as a quanta. And of course, that can lead to grainy images. <clears throat> Uh, we already discussed signal to noise, uh, but here's that nice example. I really like this one. I really think it hits home that a 0.5 in the middle of that scale represents 50% of the object information transferred to the image. More math. Uh, if you do get a question, and you might, I, I think this is one you could get. What is the spatial resolution if you are given the line pairs per centimeter? There's a couple ways you can do this math. Just like any problem, you know, um, as long as you get the right answer, no one really cares how you do it, except nowadays they care uh, in grade school. But I don't think the registry cares. Uh, so you take your line pairs, and because they're a pair, this is the way I remember it, you multiply it by two. You get a number, but you need to, to have this converted into millimeters because you were originally given centimeters. So you take 10 divided by 32 and you get 0.3125. That sounds about right because we don't look at things on a, on a centimeter or, or really much bigger than millimeters. This is about the size of a pixel when you think about it. So if you get an answer that's, you know, 2.3 millimeters, that's too big, right? Uh, answer should be around 0.2 to 
millimeters. A contrast to noise ratio is typically defined, although this is probably not a mathematical calculation that you will actually have to do, but it would be defined as the contrast, so they would have to quantify that, right? They'd have to somehow put a number on that, divided by the amount of noise, which they'd also have to quantify. And if you were to do that for three different systems, you could then compare those systems to which one has a better contrast to noise ratio. Higher contrast to noise obviously is what's optimal, right? You'd rather have more contrast than noise. Uh, and therefore, the higher the CNR, the better your chance of a diagnosis, and that would be the equipment you'd want to purchase versus something else. Okay, some of this I'm going to skip, right? Because you can read about IDs, you can read a little about DICOM. Again, this is one of those things where, yes, you suffer over some of the questions, but then when you look at the content specs and it looks like they might ask like three or less DICOM questions versus general physics questions, which one do you study more? Oops. <clears throat> and I suspect in a few years that uh, CR plates will be gone anyway. Uh, with the advent of portable flat panel detectors, uh, we don't need the cassettes anymore. When they were stationary stuck in a, stuck in a table, then how did you go do a portable? But now we can do portables with flat panel detectors. Yeah, they're a little heavy, but that'll change too. Uh, okay, digital image processing. Uh, basically, that's known as reconstruction. Units themselves, I'm gonna skip kind of on this, but you have reconstruction for, for all this stuff. Everything ends up being digital, ultimately. Uh, what is actually on an operating, see some of this stuff is just, you know it, you've been working with it. But at the same time, you're taking the one test that kind of wants to ask you questions on, on everything. So hopefully some of the questions that you get are like super easy and you just breeze right through them. <clears throat> um, so at home, you can watch the videos. Those are all the things we deal with. Here's our tube. Will you get a picture on the tube? Yeah, maybe one. This part is my area, and this is DeVito. But that's how we separate the two. Um, I love this video, actually. This is actually where you're applying the MA, and it really does heat up kind of like my toaster oven. <clears throat> It gets hot. Do you need to memorize some of the degrees? Maybe, maybe not. Um, thoriated tungsten. The reason why they combine it with thorium is just to increase its melting point so that it doesn't snap. Right? I can't even use the analogy of a, of a light bulb anymore because everyone has those spiral looking ones now. So they're, they're not the same. Uh, the focusing cup, we said, has a negative charge. Uh, sometimes that charge is turned on and off uh, and switched. What did they call that? Grid control. Grid control. Thank you. See, at this point, you guys know more than me, right? Because you've been studying. That's good. Um, okay. Uh, actual filament, about a centimeter for the smaller one, the one that's less lengthy, uh, 1.5 to 2 times. For the, for the larger one. Uh, notice though, that uh, part of the negative charge, I think, is taking this charge that's, that's considered a space charge in the space here and confining it down. Very similar to what happens with the electrostatic lenses in an II tube. Yet another subject. <laughs> 
right? <clears throat> uh, here's our anode, molybdenum, rhenium. There's a disc here. Uh, the actual bevel is all, all across this. Here's our AEC uh, detectors. Uh, not detectors, but uh, schematic or, or setup. We start with our x-ray. Most of it is absorbed. Cell feels radiation. But there's kind of like a, a sort of back and forth here where the capacitor fills up. The change in how much the capacitor fills up is based on the thyrotron, where we have our 25% density changes, or it's really intensity. Uh, and then we have our link to when the electromagnet is activated to pull off this switch here. Okay. Backup time, could have a question on backup time. Uh, in red is sort of the golden rule. Uh, should never be set at more than two times what the expected, again, that's subject to what people think about that. And obviously, depending on the procedure, should never be set to more than two times the expected exposure uh, of the system. Always important to set up your backup timer, of course, right? Uh, even if, if you set your backup timer too high, uh, you know that we dish out a lot of radiation in a very short time, right? So uh, I think I probably all told you this. Uh, as a technologist, I, I didn't really calculate too much. I would just take my time and increase it a lot for backup time, which is really wrong, right? I mean, it did the job and eventually shut off. Um, but the idea is that you, you wanted it to shut off uh, without an an extreme overexposure. No matter what, it's an overexposure if you're going to backup time to begin with. Now, this is interesting, and this is from your book. Um, the, the time of uh, the exposure time says that there's a 35% rule that states that the exposure must change, in other words, the intensity, by at least 35% to make a noticeable difference. And the reason when I when I was looking this over this morning, I automatically went back to here. And I said, well, wherever it was, where it was 25% for the for the density. Well, so if you change by plus one, which adds 25% intensity, based on this slide, it wouldn't make a difference anyway. You gotta go like two of those. That sounds like, yeah. Instead of one, you go into two. So uh, I don't know if that will actually factor into any particular question. You know, different books say different percentages, right? Uh, and it's, it's true, right? So you hope, again, that the exam is a little bit more generalized than, than you know, uh, th that you don't get a question wrong because it's a 10% difference in, in the text. Right. Uh, here's a good example, though, of when you would increase. Uh, because one, your positioning is not going to be as accurate. Uh, so it makes sense uh, to go up uh, a plus one or plus two here. Minimum response time, it's, it's interesting. Uh, minimum response time is how long does it take for essentially the message from the cell to the generator to turn off. How long does that process take? The faster it is, the less radiation the baby gets. If your exposure that you're going to use is shorter than the minimum response time, then you're going to be giving more radiation than necessary to the patient, right? In other words, if your exposure would be faster than the amount of time that it takes to turn off, then you're not saving any exposure then. You need it to turn off faster. 
And this is a big difference, right? Where an older two or a newer two uh, is at 0 0.002, right? Maybe I'm wrong. That sounds like it's a, a thousand times faster. Is that right? I mean, we're all talking about small amounts of time to begin with. So it's all, it's relative. Uh, uh, but the point is, you know, the minimum response time, if there were a question on the registry, would most likely be related to exposure. And that a faster minimum response time could reduce the exposure if your initial exposure is lower than the minimum response time that's possible with that unit. Does that make sense? I think I said that correctly. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we restrict the size of the beam. That helps improve contrast. That's all about collimation. Let's keep going. Uh, I think I'm going to pass on some of these. Positive beam limitation, that's always one of my favorites. That's when you put a different cassette size in and it automatically adjusts the uh, collimator. Doesn't allow you to collimate the field larger than the image receptor. Uh, you have some of that in, in DR too, based on the APR that you set. Like if you set up for an ankle, uh, it's not gonna give you 14, 17. That would always mess me up in my lab, right? I'd have to sometimes trick the machine in different ways. Yes. But with PBL, does that, you know, like when you set the uh, I mean, automatic exposure, AEC, uh, when you set that one, automatically it's going to activate the P PBL, right? You know, that, that matter. I, I don't know if all the systems work in, in some kind of tandem like that necessarily. Um, I just know that um, there was a little key that, that would control the PBL, and it was linked to some kind of sensor mechanism in the in the bucky itself uh, so you don't have the pbl um at least the, the kind that i'm describing in a dr system the dr must work differently because it's based on because uh, you don't change the, the the detector size in dr you just change the collimation you know it's 1717 whether you're doing a finger or an abdomen so it may work a little bit differently. But there is some kind of version of that, like I mentioned, where, where if you put down a hand, it'll probably give you a preset sort of field. Um, but we have preset yeah. collimations now. So you can tap what you want. That's so, nice. So it's better than being limited to like a specific protocol like a hand. So if you want to do a hand in a specific Cassette size, you can just pick the cassette size. I see. What, yeah. what I never liked is um, they would always bring the cassette size down to the actual measurement of the image receptor. So you would never actually see the collimation as like a border. So you would never have evidence of collimation. In my mind, it always should have been like maybe half a centimeter of what the actual image cassette size was, which would then allow you to see the collimation. Uh, okay, fluoroscopy. Lots of fun. Do you guys miss clinic? Yeah. I know you probably don't miss not getting paid, but man, you guys haven't taken an x-ray in, oh my God, hours now. I miss the tax. I don't miss the facility. Days. Are you, are you ready? Are you prepared? Um, no, I just realized today that I might ask this question because uh, when were you last there? You're you're used to like almost working full time for a while. Hmm. Well, I guess it depends. Things change too when you're getting paid. Uh, okay, uh, so I think we know the concept of of fluoroscopy. And how are we doing here? Ooh, we're running out of time. Can we go over the <laughs> parts of the two? Uh, the II. So let's, yeah, let's let's talk II. And what I think I'll do is um, give me a few days, and I'll record the rest of this, uh, and then just put it out there. Um, but you want you want you want a nice production, huh? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no editing, no cuts. But I have like
stairway to heaven, huh? Though there is that um, uh, lead apron video that I'm very happy about called Get the Lead Out, which is to wear your aprons. And anyway, so uh, I actually picked this slide because there is no other slide you need, um, really. It has a little bit of everything in it, right? So the II, which is ultimately going away also, but it's going to be a while before we, we do just flat panel detectors in fluoro. Uh, consists of something very similar to an x-ray tube in that you have uh, an anode end and a cathode end, and you have x-rays uh, going across the tube, so there's a potential difference, lots of volts in here. Um, you have a series of uh, phosphors. The whole rationale is to improve the uh, brightness of the image because floral typically was a very dark kind of situation and you had to have the lights down and there's some crazy historical pictures of radiologists with these like red goggles and, and whatnot. Uh, so the idea was to give you many, many, many more light photons than actual x-ray photons. So there is a series of conversions to do just that. Uh, and there's some different ways to quantify them uh, in terms of things like minification gain uh, versus what's the other one? Flux gain. Um, so you have this rather large input phosphor that uh, can, if it's known as multi-field, it means you can change diameter and that'll have an effect on magnification and dose. Um, it's sandwiched uh, right next to a photocathode, but our first conversion is hitting this input phosphor, which will take our, our x-rays uh, and turn them into light. And you would think it could just end right there, um, but we're going to get many more light photons than this first initial conversion because we take the light and turn it back into volts, uh, not volts, but electrons really. Uh, those electrons start to go flying across and um, to incorporate our brightness and make it brighter, we have our first um, set of minification gain, which is caused by these electrostatic lenses or what's known as focusing electrodes, which push out a negative polarity or negative charge. Our electrons again are negative, so it helps to confine them so they kind of narrow as you're going across to ultimately hit the zinc cadmium sulfide output phosphor, right? Um, that's this right here, which gives us many, many more light photons than we started <laughs> with, right? Um, this side is outside of the tube itself where we have a mirror that allows some of that light, which we think of as information, right? Think of it as data. Uh, and that goes to two different places, right? You have a video camera or a CCD. If it's a CCD, uh, then we're talking about digital imaging, right? If it's just the video camera, um, which is kind of old, terminology, then it's just information that you have at the moment in the room. You need that also. So if this was a CCD, then you definitely need this part as well, because you still need the radiologist or whoever is doing the fluoro still needs to see what they're doing. But if you want to capture that data and then eventually be able to manipulate it, you need it to go into the digital system as well. Wait, so the CCD is for the... Charge radio. couple device. Yeah, that's where the radiologist is looking at it on the screen. And then... No, the CCD is a part of the system right. in a digital system. Right. The part where they're looking at it on the screen would be a video camera or this part up here. Yes. So the CCD is what's for the... That, that's part of that system. The CCD is separate from the ADC. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're not, they're not, so not, they're not the same. Okay. It's two pieces of hardware. 
So what I, I mean, I'm going to re-record the rest of this, probably starting here. But since we're all here, maybe I do jump ahead for a couple seconds and, and talk talk about, I think we talk about this. Because this is, I think, worth going over. Like what happens in in the PSP plate? Yeah, the whole F center thing. Um, remember, you start off with a phosphor. It's in the CR plate. I do this little experiment at the beginning of every semester just to show people what, have it light up. But that light that is initially given off doesn't do anything. Uh, most of those electrons fall back uh, into place, except a few of them get trapped uh, in these F centers. They get trapped because it's interesting, there's a whole process involved known as doping. Not the kind of like doping that, uh, you know, cyclists use, in, you know, uh, poor Lance Armstrong. Uh, but um, <clears throat> that creates these little microscopic, uh, atomic level microscopic, so more than microscopic holes uh, where they get trapped. And those are known as F traps, right? You see that on the, on the next slide, right? So some of our electrons get stuck here and they stay there. This happens in the room before you ever take the cassette out. The only thing you've done is make the exposure. This is known as your latent image. So that's a question right there, right? The, the, the unprocessed electrons that are still stuck because we're going to unstick them in a second, but as we move through the process, is known as your latent image. So that energy is stored. Now what do we do? We put the cassette uh, into the CR reader. And of course, DR works differently. Right, this is not DR, this is only CR. Eventually this goes away too. But we take our laser, and the laser is yet again applying energy into the system. And that energy from the laser is sufficient to remove most of the electrons out of their F traps. Most of it. The reaction is that they then give off light. <clears throat> that light, blue, violet, there's a phosphorescence versus a fluorescence, comes off, and let me kind of skip this one for a second, comes off and is sucked in uh, through this light channel uh, into your photomultiplier tube which contains a photodiode or photocathode, excuse me. So in there, let's go back here for a second. Uh, in there, we build up this signal. So you can think of this as signal as well. But at the end of the day, we have light being turned into an electrical signal. That electrical signal, so that's still in here, that electrical signal from the PMT or photomultiplier tube has to be converted into a digital signal because computers like ones and zeros, they don't like various voltages. That happens in the ADC, analog to digital converter, which is then you have that reconstruction process which we have several PowerPoints just on that. The intensity domain versus the spatial domain versus the frequency domain uh, and histograms and all of those things, which some of that's in, in this presentation, um, but we're not gonna get to that, unfortunately. But I'll give it to you in the next day or two. Uh, to come back to this though, one of the things this is pointing out is why DR, one of the reasons why DR is better than CR. 
And specifically, one of the reasons, not all of the reasons, one of the reasons is simply about geometry, right? Pixels are square and Dells are square, but in CR, by using the laser, laser beams are round, like your flashlight. So you need to uh, kind of oversample and overlap. And it takes a much, it's a much longer process, not to mention it's in CR, it's always an indirect process. Remember, we talked about that before. <clears throat> so for that, what, for that, among other reasons, is why we, we have an intensity loss. In other words, a loss of data in this case with, with CR compared to DR. Does the PM, I mean, the photo multiplier, you know, that, that's the rest, like, you know, multiply those photons that they come in, like, kind of less from that image? So I know the word multiply, multiplier is in there. But I would really think about it as that is the area where the light is converted to an electrical signal. Now, whether you have you know, more electrical signal than you had light, I don't know what the proportions might be. I just know that's where there's a conversion. That's the way I would think about it. And that should be enough to get a question right. Uh, at that point, <clears throat> but but you, I mean, you you probably have something to that. I mean, there's the word multiply is in there, so so there's probably something going on. Okay, all right. So I think I'll stop here, rather than try to just rush the next five minutes. So I will give you guys a little bit of a head start. My understanding is that you have until one, uh, where you would come back and then get a physics lecture. More fun for you. Is there like a thermostat? Is it? Um, there, there may be. Why? 